Good morning. It's great to see you. Should we stand together and worship?
had it this morning. Because you're great. It's who you are. We come in amazement that the one who sits supreme above all things sees us, knows us, has reached down into our lives and intervened to reveal the truth to us and is at work in and through us day by day. It is staggering that we might know you, that we might be called your own, that we might have opportunity to come to you whenever we please and commune with you. And so Lord, we're grateful this morning. And we're grateful that you are above and beyond anything we face. You're more powerful than any enemy. You're greater than any obstacle. There's nothing that can prohibit your purpose in our lives. And we rejoice this morning in the God of our salvation who will complete the work he started. It's not in doubt this morning. There's not a question about it. You are going to finish what you started in our lives. And we give you praise, God. So Lord, we ask would you come and have your way in this place. Glorify yourself amongst us, we pray. And be magnified in Jesus' name. Amen. Please feel free to take your seats. If you're a child and you're heading out to children in church, now's your opportunity. Good morning. It's great to see you. I'm going to read from John chapter 6 if you want to turn there. While you're turning there, let me make one or two announcements. Um, I'm going to say the 15th of September, but I could be making that up. But the Friday and Saturday of that weekend, there's a women's conference on in Newcastle, Elam. I think a number of ladies from here are going to go. If you're a, a woman of any age and you'd like to go, uh, please let Louise or Fanny know and um, we'll try to arrange to go together. Um, and then this morning at the back, you'll see some of these things. It's a membership card. Um, if you've been fellowshipping with us for a little while and this is your church, but you're not yet a member, we'd love for you to become a member here. It's not about controlling your life. We're not going to try and take over what you do. Um, but it's just so we know who's with us and who's in our flock. Um, and so it's part of the governance structure of the church. If you want to know more about that, please feel free to come and have a conversation. But if that's something you think you'd like to do, there's some cards at the back. If you fill them in, throw them in the offering box or hand them to someone um, that would be wonderful. John 6, and I'm going to read from verse 22. The next day the crowd that had stayed on the opposite shore of the lake realised that only one boat had been there and that Jesus had not entered it with his disciples, but they had gone away alone. Then some boats from Tiberias landed near the place where the people had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. Once the crowd realized that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into the boats and went to Capernaum in search of Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, you were looking for me, not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him the Father, God the Father, has placed his seal of approval. Then they asked him, what must we do to do the works God requires? Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one who, has sent, who he has sent. So they asked him, what sign will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. 
Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. So they said, Always give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I have told you, you have seen me and you still not do and you still do not believe. All those the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never drive away. For I've come down from heaven, not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall use none of all those he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. At this the Jews began grumble, grand grumble about him, because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he say now I have come down from heaven? Jesus has fed the 5,000. He's sent the disciples off in the immediate aftermath. He's dismissed the crowds. He's gone up the mountain to pray. And then, in the middle of the night, has decided to take a wander across the lake. Um, and so the next day, the crowds that have been fed are looking for him. And they realise he's not in the place they expected him to be. They saw he didn't get into the boat. They saw he didn't go <coughs> on from this place. But he's not there. So they travel over to Capernaum, and when they arrive, they ask him, when did you get here? It would have been a great opportunity for Jesus to tell them, Oh, I had a wander across the lake. Oh, I had a wander. Yeah, I walked on water. So in the middle of the night, I decided I wanted to be somewhere else and I just walked on water because I'm God. But he doesn't engage with the, the substance of their question. He says, you're not looking for me because you saw the signs but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Those seem like similar things to me. They're both the experience of the miraculous. Seeing the signs and eating the loaves don't seem a million miles apart because they had to have seen what took place in the feeding of the 5,000 in order to have et. Does that make sense? <coughs> I'm going to suggest to you though one's about identification while the other's about gratification There's a group of people he has just fed, yet Jesus' issue with them is their pursuit of him is about their full bellies, not their recognition of who he is as a result of what he's done. <coughs> it's about what they've enjoyed from him, not who they've understood him to be. Because signs point to something. There's a really interesting verse in Mark 6. Records Jesus walking on water, following the feeding of the 5,000. And he approaches the boat there in fear. And he says, it's me, don't be afraid. And then verse 51 says, then he climbed into the boat with them. And the wind died down. They were completely amazed. Verse 52. For they had not understood about, their lo about the loaves. Their hearts were hardened. 
The disciples have been party to the feeding of the 5,000. They have distributed the miracle. They've seen Jesus give thanks, break the bread, and whatever happened next, happen. Yet they didn't understand the loaves, is what Mark 6 52 says and had they understood that moment they wouldn't have been amazed that Jesus walked on water and got in the boat and the wind died down that's what it says they then he climbed into the boat with them and the wind died down they were completely amazed for they had not understood about the loaves yeah. had they understood this wouldn't have been amazing <coughs> because is it more impressive to take five loaves and two fish and feed 5,000 plus women and children or to walk on water? Both of them require complete defying of the laws of nature. They demonstrate you can do whatever you want. And had they understood the loaves, this wouldn't have been amazing. And Jesus' issue with the crowd is, you're not here because you've identified the signs and correctly identified me. You're here for you. You're not here for me. You're here for you. And I think that's often our truth. If we're honest, very often our relationship with God is about me, not him. I'm not here for him, I'm here for what he can do for me. I haven't come for him because of who he is. I've come because he's done some good stuff in the past and I'm hoping he'll do some good stuff in the future. We come with our lists and our plans and agendas about what we want him to do. And I've said this before, a lot of us are trying to figure out how we get him to do what we want him to do. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's how we spend our time. How do we get him to do what I want him to do in my life? How do I get Jesus to perform in the way I'd like him to for me? Because I've got some ideas about what I'd like to happen in my life. I've got some plans about what I'd like to see happen. What I'd like him to do. And I spend my time going, why won't you do the thing I want you to do? Because it's about my satisfaction and gratification, not about him. Does that make sense? It's not the longing of a growing relationship and revelation of Christ. It's a vehicle to the thing we want, if we're honest. That very often... What Jesus is, is how we hitch a ride to where we want to be. To what we want from life. And the conversation is fascinating to me. They ask Jesus, when did you get here? Jesus doesn't respond to the question. He says, you've come because you ate, not because you saw the signs. Don't pursue food that you get food that endures. So they ask, what work does God require for that food? And Jesus says, believe the one God has sent. So their question is, what sign will you give us so we can believe you? And Jesus said, God gave manna, not Moses. Bread comes from heaven, gives life to the world. And they say, always give us this bread. He says, I am the bread of life. At which point, they're unhappy. 
I can't help but feel they were willing to engage in all of that conversation while they thought bread was on the table. They identify Jesus as the one that's come from heaven. Jesus says them, do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him God the Father has placed a seal of approval. What must we do to do the works of God, to do the works God requires? Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one who he has sent. And they say, what time will you give? So that we might believe you. They're willing to believe if they get bread. And when he says, bread comes from heaven, gives life to the whole world, there is, they are asking Jesus, give us this bread. But at the point he says, I am the bread of life and there's no longer food on the table here. We're not going to get something to eat today, boys. Suddenly this is a different prospect. Because my gratification isn't going to be satisfied. They appear to identify Jesus as the one God has sent. They appear to be willing that Jesus is from God, except that Jesus is from God. But when he says, I'm not about to produce another lot of food, they're suddenly upset. I don't feel like that's different for us sometimes. I'm willing to do the stuff while it gets the result I want. I'm willing to engage in the spiritual practices while it achieves for me the purpose for which I intended it to. I'm willing for Jesus to say whatever he wants as long as I get what I want on the end of it. But when I'm not getting what I want, and suddenly the conversation shifted. Very often I'm less engaged. And not everything that satisfies you, that gratifies you is good. And there's an awful lot of people in an absolute mess because they've chased the thing that they thought might satisfy them. People pursue wealth, stuff, careers. All things that don't last. But seem to promise something to fill the need for satisfaction in our lives. And it never be beneficial to them. And I'm going to suggest to you. One of my concerns. Is that Christians. End up in a mess because they chase spiritual gratification. You can get spiritual experience and it not be from God. 1 John 4 and verse 1. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Matthew 7 and verse 21, I have repeated to you on a number of occasions. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Matthew 24, 24, false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. And I believe in a God who does miracles. 
And I believe in a God who moves supernaturally. And I believe in a God who does speak through prophecy, who ministers into situations, who transforms things, who does great signs and wonders. But not all of that stuff is apparently from him. And there's a danger for us as Christians that we get very excited about a lot of that stuff. And actually we're chasing spiritual gratification. We want the spiritual experience. And actually sometimes at the cost of who it's coming from. Who you're coming to has to be the priority. Not what you're coming for. Second Timothy 4 and verse 3 says the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from truth and turn aside to myths. But you keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship, do the work of evangelist, discharge all duties of your ministry. What is it that causes people to abandon truth? Apparently it's to suit their own desires. It's about what satisfies and gratifies them. It's about what they want. So they follow people who say what they want to hear. Not pursue truth because I have decided there's something I want. That's what Tim Paul writes to Timothy. A time will come when people will not put up the sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers who say what their itching ears want to hear. And I think in a situation where... <coughs> Lots of us are hungry for God to move. Yeah. We want to see the glory of God revealed in the earth. We want to see him move in power in and through our lives. There's a danger for us that we need to be aware of. That actually I'm pursuing something rather than him. And what Paul says to Timothy is not massively encouraging. Endure hardship. Oh great. That wasn't the plan for my life, Jesus. That wasn't what I hoped for in this. But it has to be about him. Not about what I get. Later on in John 6, having had further conversation with the multitude, they all begin to walk away. And Jesus says to his disciples, verse 67, Do you want to leave too? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. That's the place I want to live in. He is the Holy One of God. Yeah. So what I want is set aside because I recognize who he is. The source of food that endures is Christ. And the reality for my life is he knows better. I've come to submit myself to him. To surrender my will to his. Recognising 
he is supreme over all things. So my plans aren't as good as his. My agenda's not as good as his. What I'd like to happen in my life isn't more important than what he wants to do with my life. And it's interesting to me that the group that gather, when Jesus says, don't work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you, for on him God the Father has placed the seal of approval. They ask him, what must we do to do the works God requires? It's interesting to me that their question is about works. What must we do to do the works? And I think a whole lot of us have lived our lives believing that our performance produces the results we want. So I try and do what God expects of me in the hope that I get what I want out of it. I'm trying to do what he asks of me so he does what I want him to do. It's a transactional deal. If I do this, God, you'll do this. So if I say enough prayers and sing enough songs, maybe, maybe it's about the length of my prayers, or maybe I need to rebuke the devil or read my Bible more, or perform in some way or other in order that I get what I want out of him. And so often our spiritual practice is in pursuit of an outcome rather than in pursuit of a person. It's about the result that I get from doing the thing. And I have lived in stages of my life where praying and believing towards something, I've had a bad day. I've not nailed it. It's been not brilliant. And I've assumed now I've taken a step back in the purposes of God because I'm in this transactional relationship with him. Where if I do what he wants, he'll do what I want. I don't do things out of desire for him or longing for him. I do it to get bread. I do it to get bread because I had bread and it was tasty and my belly was full. So I'd like some more bread. And it is the reality of a lot of what I think Christian faith looks like today. I'm playing the transactional deal with God. I want to come to him recognizing who he is. that my worship of him isn't to get what I want but because he's worthy because I approach the God of all things yeah. and go you're incredible 
You're utterly amazing. You are beautiful. And when I recognize who I'm coming to, I'm going to tell you very often my agenda seems less important than it did. But if I don't live with the recognition of who I'm coming to, my agenda is the primary issue of my life. See, what God chooses to do here is up to him. Amen. It's up to him. And I'm okay with that because he's God. And I'm confident about who he is. He's good. And he's promised that he'll make all things work together for my good. So I'm at ease with the fact that whatever he does here is up to him. When I recognize him as God, but when I come here to do a deal, very often I leave disappointed because I've come for my transaction yeah. and I feel like I've upheld my end of the bargain. Well, I sang really loud today, Jesus, and I had both hands in the air. And still the glory didn't come. He's the bread of life. He's the bread of life. His commitment is to satisfy you. But you have to feast on him. If I come to him, for him, I don't go hungry. But if I use him as a vehicle to fill myself in other ways, I do. If he is the tool by which I satisfy myself with other things, you will always be dissatisfied. Because you are looking for things that will never satisfy you. If he's the vehicle by which you get the promotion, that's wonderful. But let me tell you, the promotion won't satisfy you. If he's the vehicle by which you gain wealth and prosperity, that's brilliant. But it won't satisfy you. Jesus is all I need. He's all I need. I am blessed. I have no doubt about that in my life. I'm blessed. But if I lost everything I possess on this earth tomorrow, I still am richer than anybody who doesn't know him. If I lost everything I possess tomorrow... I am still better off than those who aren't walking with him. If it all gets taken away from me today, I'm still in a great place. Because the king of the ages is on my side. Because I am a child of God with a hope that cannot be stolen from me. He's what I want. He's what I want. Yeah. He is what I want. And the reality is, I live in a society that tells me I need all sorts of other things. Mm -hmm. And there are all sorts of people who want to tell me mm -hmm. what I need to have in my life in order to be happy in order to be successful, in order to be rich. But I don't think there's a better place to be than in relationship with Christ, who sits enthroned 
on high, for whom nothing is impossible. Who is beautiful and wonderful and glorious in every way. And I know I don't know better than him. I don't always act like that. It's not always the behaviour in my life. Very often I, I am telling him what I know and what he should be doing. But I know when I stop and consider it, I do not know better than him. Paul writes this incredible thing in Philippians chapter 3. He says, whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings. Becoming like him in his death and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I've already obtained all this or have arrived at my goal. But I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is head, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which Christ Jesus has called me heavenward in Christ. Paul is sat in prison. All of the book of Acts is done. He's achieved some stuff for the kingdom. He has had an impact on the world. He's seen the miraculous. He's planted churches. He's watched communities come to know Christ. But in order to pursue the goal of knowing Christ for himself, he'll forget it all. He'll forget it all. Everything he's done. And Jesus doesn't seem to make satisfaction hard in John 6 they want to know what must they do Jesus says believe I am the bread of life anyone who comes to me will never go hungry and those who believe in me will never be thirsty I don't need anything else. And Christ is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. That's what Hebrews 11, 6 says. But the issue is he rewards those who seek him it's a pursuit of him it's not about what it's about who and so I thought I'd mention John 6 
to you today because the reality of my life is very often it's about what not who that very often I'm coming to him about what not who that when I call on him it's about what not who that I want to tell him what I need and what I want and all the things I not recognize who I'm coming to and I'm invited to cast my cares on him and I'm invited to present my requests to him But what changes me is the recognition of who I am in relationship with. And I believe in a God who does good stuff. And I believe in a God who blesses our lives. And I believe in a God who moves on behalf of his people. But I also believe I don't get to dictate that. I want to come to him for him whether I get what I want out of it or not because it's better than what I can have to offer he's the bread of life I want to be satisfied by him not by the things I got out of him We stand together and worship.
Nothing else. Nothing else. Nothing else will do. I just want you. Nothing else. Nothing else. Nothing else will do.
for the assurance of your presence that you will never leave us or forsake us. You will be with us always, even till the end of the age. Help us to know it, God. Help us to recognize it in our lives. And Lord, help us to enjoy it. You are incomparable. <laughs> there is none like you. And Lord, we're grateful for your commitment to satisfy us. Help us, God, to not be distracted by the things of this world. To not be drawn in to a transactional relationship with you, but to draw near to you, knowing you will respond and draw near to us. And it's your presence that will make the difference in our lives. You're a great God and we love you. Have your way, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. God bless you. It's great to see you. We'll see you soon.